I encourage you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. We're on question number 15, and I think it's a good one. We kind of hit it, and then, but I want us to put the verses preceding this to kind of have the impact that I think the writer wanted to uh, achieve with his readers. And I want us to feel that, and when you, when you go through the text and you, you begin to realize what uh, is being developed, then I think you'll understand this. Why is it a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God? Verse 31 makes the statement, but what has proceeded there that would make you fearful? And just start with that statement. What is it in that statement that would cause you to have uh, fear or maybe a reverence? We're in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 31. Lesson number six. Well, th yes, but let's just start with this statement. What kind of God is he? He's living, isn't he? So he's not sitting there as a, a statute, statue. He's not sitting there idle. He's not sitting there he can't move. He can't do anything. He's living. Now, to your point, Corey, what do we see in verse 27? But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fierceness of fire. And there's that fierceness. Is the fire so hot or is God full of wrath? The indignation is indeed the, the fierceness of the fire which shall devour us. It's not the, necessarily the intensity of the heat because it's not going to annihilate you. It's not going to bring you to ashes, and it's not annihilation. It's a loss of the well-being that you once had or could have had. And the fierceness is dealing with the wrath of God who is administering this punishment. Then we look at, at verse 30. For you know it is said, vengeance belongs to me. And who will he judge? His people. I can see judging the nations out there, but judging the people, and that is the same God that says, vengeance belongs to me. You're, you've done despite under the spirit of grace. You've trodden underfoot the Son of God. You consider the blood by which was there to sanctify you from sin, so you can stand before me as a holy God. And you've done that. Vengeance belongs to me. I'm living, and I'm full of wrath. That's why it's fearful. Now, we can go all over the Bible and sit here, well, I I'm fearing God, reverence God. But when you understand that I can be judged as his people and the vengeance belongs to him as he was with anybody else out here. That's sobering. That causes fear. Not that I'm going to, I'm just so uh, uptight about being a Christian. I've got my hope settled in heaven. I've, I've got... My, my foundation for my justification before God is Jesus Christ. Do the best I can, repent of my sins when that comes along, knowing that Christ's blood is still available. I have all of that ahead of me, but, but I, I, my faith is understanding I can fall to that place. And we've seen earlier as in Hebrews 6 that it's impossible to renew you to repentance. There's not another sacrifice for sins that can be offered that would uh, cause you to want to offer it because it's only Jesus that could take away your sins. So pay attention to content. I know you do that, but just to, I want to encourage you to do that because those are some points that may never come out in the class. We say, well, uh, it's because he's a living God. That's good. He has vengeance and he has wrath and he judges his own people. That's me. I think I want to be away to that. He's not talking about, I'm going to judge the world. He is. But I, I will judge my own people. It's a fearful. Look at verse 30. I will recompense again. The Lord shall judge his. Why does he put his people there? But he's talking about Christians. He's, he's talking about, in the context here, you die without compassion. Well, two or three witnesses, that was Jewish. That was the Jews' standard for which they would administer capital punishment. And, but how much sore punishment? How much sore punishment? We talked about that. Is there a punishment worse than physical death? Yeah. It's separation from God. It's spiritual death and the flames of the fires of hell. All of that 
is, is in here as we pick things out from other places. But if we didn't pick anything out from other places, I would have enough information to know why he said, why he can say here, it, it, it may just make the statement. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Any comments or, or questions on that before uh, we move on? Okay, so God scared you. <laughs> He's warned you. He scared you. Now the writer's going to encourage you. He's going to encourage you. Because we ask this question, how does the writer encourage his readers while at the same time imparting sobering warnings? See, you can give warnings, but you can also do it in the, in the light of encouragement because you don't, you're not going to encourage them the way they're going. They're going to apostasy. Somebody's got to stop them. Somebody's got to put something out there, and the Hebrew writer does a good job of that. You're, you're, you're forfeiting that which is greater. You're forfeiting that which is the, what was God has been planning for. You forfeited that, and you don't have forgiveness of sins under, under, with lambs and bulls and goats and the blood of, of, of animals. You made this case where he said, I've, I've got this, and it's so much better than, than to what I could ever have. So I'm not going to give that up. So he's not taking <clears throat> away the pressure of the teaching. You don't, you don't take off that. Well, we just got to back off of that. No, you, you, you bring it out. But there's a sense of encouragement that they can, they can show that indeed was something of, of encouragement to him that he could say good about him right now. And so what do you read there that would fit that? How does he do that? I'm assuming he does. That's why I asked the question. Now, you proved me wrong, so it has nothing to do with the context. Has nothing. I don't understand that question. I think we do. How does he do that? What does he do in the very next verse? Call to remembrance your former days when you were no good people and you're still serving, not serving God. He doesn't do that, does he? Call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were enlightened. What does that mean? What, uh, that's, he wants them to go back to those days. And he said, former days when you were uh, dead in your sins. What does he take them back to? The beginning of being a Christian, isn't it? Being, being saved. Did we see that? Uh, go back to Hebrews. No, we'll go back there in a minute. We'll, let's just pick it up here. Enlightened. That means when you became a Christian. Because see, that involves I, my mind was opened up. I turned from darkness to light. My, I had the light of the gospel. And I repented. And I had my bodies washed with pure water. And the guilt of sin was taken away by the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And my obedience to the gospel. I was enlightened. And for someone to say, well, that's not when you're saved. I, I, have, I think you have a hard time proving that scripturally. But you'll know, we talked about that last time when we were in Hebrews 6. They said, well, you just were enlightened, but you really weren't fully saved. He just uses the term here. He didn't go into all the details, as, you'll see in he, as we saw in Hebrews 6. But you remember that when you were enlightened, when you became a Christian, when the darkness of sin was exposed, you turned away from it. You were enlightened. It encompassed all that would be involved in knowledge and obedience. It was their beginning place. That's the place he takes them to that's encouraging. Why? Because you endured a great conflict of what? Sufferings. Why is it called a conflict? Now your Bible may say something else, so bring it out. Help us. Uh, is a conflict of suffering. You no know, pain of suffering? Yes, it's there. Str struggling? It, it took away my plans for the day. <laughs> I had a zero in on that. It was a conflict, a struggle, a, a something against me. It's a conflict. I don't want that. I don't want to suffer. I just love to suffer for the cause of Christ. No. <laughs> you don't like the pain of that. You see... The benefit of that, you see the joy in that, so you can endure it. Say they were enduring that. He'll, he's going to tell you, tell, tell, you, tell you why. You endured a great conflict of sufferings. And we will 
drop down to verse eight, question number 18, in what three ways had they suffered? What does he say? I come across a big accident and there's people hurt in the car. Oh, it's a horrible scene. They were a gazing stock. People around them saw them and they brought reproaches upon them. They're a, they stood out in a negative way. Remember when you endured that? Because that's what had happened to them. And they're standing out in a negative way. That's enough to cause it. They're all looking at me. They look down upon me. I'm just a Christian. Yeah, that's what it was like. And it also, he does that both by reproaches and the afflictions, the painful things that were coming up on us, the things we had to suffer, and the reproaches. The idea of the bad names they call you, the bad things that they identify you with. They look down upon you. They, they're blaspheming your holy name and good name. What do you do? You just keep on being good. You keep on doing what's right. And as we see in other passages, they'll be ashamed if they have a conscience at all. But if they don't, you're not going to give up the, the fight. You're not going to give up the life. See, he doesn't want them to give up. They weren't giving up then. You endured all of that. And they were so, so I'm a gazing stock. I'm a taking in the reproaches upon me and the afflictions that come. And then thirdly, my heart's pained. Because why? Partly becoming partakers were them that were so used. Does your pain hurt me? If we're Christians, it does. Does my pain hurt you? Do you care? It should, because we're Christians. We're all going, we're pilgrims going along in the, in the Bible. You think people that are on their journeys trying to get in the United States, you don't think they have a story among themselves that nobody else understands? Or what it's been like to be out in a hundred degree heat, no water. How women have been raped. What the things that they've endured to become a citizen or try to get into this country. And you don't feel that? I tell you who does feel it. The fellow travelers. And we feel the pain when we have to go through calamities and catastrophes that we all share together. Well, God's people were sharing this. And he says, do you remember that? Now, I wouldn't call that the good old days. But that's Paul saying, I know that's in you. I know that's why you started. What changed? What changed? You can't take the heat anymore? Why? Maybe you need a dose of chapter 11. Let's just call it the lack of faith. You need to know what faith is. And he'll get there real shortly, won't he? But he reminds them of those things that is there. So the idea of a gazing stock by reproaches, so just the fact that they're looking at you in a negative way, they're talking about you in a negative way, you're undergoing the afflictions, they're ostracizing you from their company, they don't care about you and all that, and then you're feeling the pain of everybody else. What a day. What a time. It's not joyous, but I'm enduring it. I'm in hearing that. So had persecution destroyed these people as they had compassion upon them? No. In fact, <clears throat> you both had compassion on them that were in bonds. And then here's another area. You know, if you, if you have gazing stock and you got reproaches under that, and the second thing, you, you've got partakers them that are so you got that, then you got that again, plus they're taking away my possessions. There's your three. And you got the categories underneath them, but you got the three big categories. But so you're, you took joyfully the spoiling of your possessions. How did you endure all of that? What does he say? Here's his exhortation. And here's his encouragement that they need to come back at. What did he say next? How could you go through that, them taking your property and you just sit there 
and it doesn't destroy you. In fact, you took joyfully, probably inwardly, you don't sit there with a grin on your face, hey, you know, you're not trying to make them worse at you, so let me take some more from your stuff. You don't want that, but inside, what keeps you going? I've got something better. And you people getting ready to apostatize, you don't have anything better. There's a mixture of encouragement, but flat, cold, hard facts of getting to the heart of people. I, I think that's the way we ought to teach. And Paul is looking at, or the writer of Hebrews, he's looking at where they've gone. And, and that's, that's easy because they're getting ready to, they're apostatizing. They were at a place, and he does not forget that. Did he forget it in Hebrews 6? This is, I think it's time to go to Hebrews 6 again. Just pick up the pieces. He's hitting at, he's taking the same approach as he's done earlier. So here are people, he's trying to say that once, verse, uh, verse 4, as touching those who were once enlightened, taste of the heavenly gift, may partake of the Holy Spirit, taste of the good word of God, and of the age to come, and then fell away. There's nothing out there of a sacrifice that can, bring you to repentance. You're just cr crucifying the Son of God afresh and putting him to open shame. It's no benefit to you, and there's nothing else to offer you. So that's why nobody can bring you to repentance. I don't have anything to offer you. You've got to realize, I've got to come back to where I was. Verse 9. Here's his encouragement. Beloved, we are persuaded of what? Better things of you. And the things that accompany salvation, for, for as always speak, for, it's not, for God is not unrighteous to forget what you've done in the past. The work that you did of love, that you showed toward his name. Don't talk about individuals, his name, his authority, which involved in individuals. What, what they did. You ministered to the saints and still do. I just want you to desire the same diligence under the fullness of the hope even to the end that you be not sluggish but imitators of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises we're getting ready in Hebrews 10 on our part they need patience mixed with their faith they need to know what faith is how it operates these these verses are not just put there for encyclopedic work I will go to Hebrews 11 and find out what faith is boop 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 that's why we study it in its context, and I want us to feel it. I want us to see, these are words that drive us to things. It takes, it, it, it takes some um, time and thinking to go along with where, where, what, what gutters he want me in. You know, he's driving me somewhere, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I want to get in that role. I want to get in there where God's taken me. And he's done it in six, and he kind of does it again the same way in ten. But see, the problem is, they started at a good place. And now they're turning their back upon that good place. But they haven't been destroyed yet, have they? And he wants them to remember, you know why you took joyfully those things? Because you have treasure in heaven that nobody can touch. And it will be there for you. You're just going to have to endure and do so. You started that. Do you remember that? You remember where you were? And the reason they weren't destroyed is because they have the hope of heaven. What did Hanum, Hamanaeus and Phileas do in 2 Timothy when they said the resurrection is past already? What in effect had they done? They overthrow the faith of some. If I don't have a treasure in heaven understood, if I, if I don't have the future in, in grasp of my mind and my desires and all of that, let's just eat and drink for tomorrow we die, and that's it. Why are we going through this? And all of those are truths everywhere else, but it harmonizes what we're seeing here. I just want us to see whoever the Hebrew writer was, they weren't just trying to tell people off, just getting them told, because they had to deal with error. They were recognizing what good they had in them, 
and recognizing why have you changed? Why are you turning away? You're turning away to something that's not better. And what they're doing, they're, what they've done, they've turned their way, uh, uh, not away against the local people there. Local people are a result of turning away from Christ. They've turned their backs upon Christ and his sacrifice. It means nothing to them any longer. He's not giving up and driving that home. He does it again and again and again. But there's a context in which you can correct error. People don't like to err. I mean, they say there's not any good way to skin a cat from the cat's perspective. So sometimes you have to, to do that. But we realize that, that people are not totally evil all the time. <laughs> there's something good that you could say about them. Why not bring it up? As the context is very much a part, this is what you were doing. And you weren't falling away from that. Is that what's causing you to now fall away? What's changed? Has the hope of heaven changed? God's demands haven't changed. And his, his, his salvation, the grace of God hasn't changed. So don't you change. Don't you change. Had prior to, no, it hadn't destroyed the people. Number 17, and I'm stuck again. Uh, number 18, well, three ways they suffer, we got that. So question number 19 on our, our page, what, had that, what did they have that helped them face the loss of possessions with joy? We've just answered that, and it's just hit it again, because I think it's very important to, to stress that. They had a better and abiding, abiding one. It's no, you can't take it away. You won't be able to take that away. And I, I think if, if we teach our children anything in life, this would be something very distinctive. Because in our world, and it has, it's always been that way, but especially in our, our times, materialism is, is really a, a God that's driving people's lives. They want this, they want that. Children grow up with things around them that they could have. And they, they grow up in, in prosperity, most of them. And we, we, are, we, we have abundance, and that becomes a problem, it becomes an issue. I want, do my boys want that type of sneaker? You know, but why is that so important? Why do I have to pay 150 bucks for that? Uh, and then you have knockoffs and you, you have all the, the problems with that, but you take away my possessions and I took it joyfully? No, they, they didn't put a microphone on your face. How do you feel about that tornado wiped away your all your back? How do you feel about that? Oh, that's just wonderful. No, it's just wonderful. <laughs> no, it's sad. And we can be suffering and yet joy, joyful. Inwardly, said that, I'm, I'm, st I'm alive for the day. But it didn't take away where my treasures are. I can rebuild. Maybe not like it was before. I don't have any insurance. Well, we'll safety net somewhere. We'll find a way. We're still alive and we're still alive. We'll make it. But I can take joyfully because why are they taking my possessions? I'm a Christian and you don't like it. You got power. And I'm not going to give up being a Christian. At the same time, you're not going to see me melt all over the ground because of what you're doing. The solid faith in God helps you to get through these difficult times. They say, I don't understand it. Why he's not completely... He must be a strong man. He must be a strong uh, inward constitution. No, I just, you just have a faith in Christ. And the weakest of all men can have a strong faith in Christ, and they can act this very same way. It's not that they're John Wayne's, and they're going to be, be macho men. It's this fact that they're strong in the faith. And when they can't, when, when people cannot destroy you because they take away your prized possessions of earthly things, and they take away your, your freedom, you're in jail, or they take away your life, you could be burned at the stake. Why don't you denounce, why don't you denounce Jesus? Well, I've lived 86 years and he's never done anything wrong to me. Why should I denounce him now? Men said that, going to the fires of death. How can you do that? Because your faith in Christ who's overcome the world. 
And you know who the only ones that say that? You, 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 and me as Christians. And that, that allows us to deal with life. Even when it's in its darkest stage. And deal it with dignity and confidence and yes, inward joy. I know why they took it. Now, a tornado, I know that those things happen, but I've got my treasures in heaven. But to know it, that they're taking away your possessions because you're a Christian, persecuting because you're a Christian, they're denouncing you because you're a Christian, and you're living the life of a Christian, maybe one day they'll be ashamed to come to their senses. But till then, I'll just keep living. And living above the world because you have, you have the knowledge of what things really are with Christ and God. And that's, that strengthens us. And that, that uh, I think if you could teach your children that we got just wiped out and all of your toys are gone and all your possessions are gone, all, all the things that you thought were important, they're wiped out. And they're not destroyed. <laughs> You've done good in teaching your children about how to live in this world. Because the worst things that can happen will not destroy their faith. Question number 20. When Christians fall away, their end is what? What, how will we describe their end? I had to speak up a little bit. Perdition. Well, okay. What does that fancy word mean? Perdition. You call it destruction? I think that sounds like annihilation, doesn't it? But it doesn't, does it, David? And that's, but that's how people look at it. You go into a teenager's room, and they have completely destroyed it. What do you mean? It no longer exists? So when you have teenagers, you've seen that room, and it's still existing, isn't it? What had to be done? You destroyed it. What do they need to do? Clean it up. <laughs> but it's not functioning. I can't step here and step there. I can't have a free access because all your clothes are on there. All your toys are there. I, I just can't get around. It's destroyed. It lost what it was. It lost its well-being where it's neat and tidy. Your toys are over there. Your clothes are over there. And you can go get them. And you can destroy it again. You're going to clean it up. But all of that, you lost your, your well-being. And it still exists. That's hell. That's the second death. I'm separated from God. And I am weeping and gnashing teeth. That sounds like not annihilation to me when I'm in the lake of fire where there's the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who's weeping and who's gnashing their teeth? Well, you just been talking about God. He's full of vengeance and so forth. And he's gnashing his teeth. No, I'm the one gnashing his teeth. I am suffering, Matthew 25. They'll suffer eternal punishment. How can I feel punishment if I don't exist? What punishment is that? Where I'm weeping and gnashing teeth, there's the punishment, I'm separated from God. I'm feeling that you have to have existence in order to have everlasting punishment. It lasts as long as it's capable of lasting. And so the word perdition is uh, in, indeed important because an understanding that that it, it's it's going to last as long as it can last and can God last for eternity yeah has he created us to last for eternity yeah it's capable of that and here's the fires that never are quenched it can last forever and there's a consequences what is it like there's the weeping the gnashing of teeth and I am destroyed because I have lost the well-being of created in the image of God. Yes, I fell away, fall, I fall short of his glory, but through Christ I was able to be his people again. And I turn my back on him. And here I am. It's better to never have known the truth of that gospel than after knowing it to fall away. I wonder why. Because I know what I had. 
These people, if that happens, they knew when they were steadfast in their faith, they knew that they were invincible because of their trust in the Lord. They knew that they had a more abiding treasure in heaven than they, anybody could ever have upon earth. And I gave it up for what? Thus the flesh, the pride of life, which is a big thing in Hebrews, I think, be among the people, be, be exalted by the people around you. And they were on their way to apostasy. And if they ended up that way, that, that is terrible. So when Christians, see, Christians can fall away unto what end? Perdition, destruction. And that can be eternally that way as well. When Christians fall away, just the other side, of, really the same picture, but a different angle of looking at it. When Christians fall away, they do not have and because I put that, doesn't mean, well, that uh, must be a little a bigger word. You know, it could be a phrase. <laughs> but I put two there. They do not have soul salvation. They, the, the saving of their souls. But we are not of them that shrink back to perdition, but of them that have what? Faith unto the what? Saving of the soul. I thought once saved, always saved. Here people are his people. That we, we, but now we have fallen away and we don't have faith now unto the saving of the soul, so we don't have the salvation of our soul when we, Christians, fall away. It's a great passage in its context. You don't have to worry about, oh, I don't, I don't think that's the right context. It's, it's nailing. It's, it's who he's talking to. And what you need, you need now with your faith, you need the Perseverance. You need to stay with it. You once started it, let's get back there. And you stay with that. And he closes by the idea you need to have uh, the faith under the saving of the soul. You can have a faith and, and lose it and not and, uh, to the point of not being saved to the, uh, the soul. So now you wonder why he's talking about faith in chapter 11. <laughs> I, I, I hope we'll say, I know, I know exactly. That makes sense. They need to understand, you know, there were some people that we admire from before the flood, during the flood, after the flood, our forefathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Samson, Gideon, and what do we call them? The heroes of faith, don't we? That's okay. Our heroes, they, they ought to be heroes. But what we're doing, I want to see what faith looks like. I want to see what, and, and it's personified in real people. People that live. That's why when we get at the end of this, therefore let us see that we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Who's the witnesses? What we're about to read about in chapter 11. They've lived that life. This is what they were looking for. This is how they confronted the world around them. You can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. Okay. So let's, let's get started. We got, we got a few, few moments here. So let's say, what is faith? What is faith? Open any question. You can't be too wrong with this one. Well, if you were just to put a definition and you, you hadn't looked at this passage yet, what is it? What is it? Okay. And you're going to put that unseen there, but just trust and belief is, is what it is. But it's, it's kind of interesting when we look at what he says about uh, faith, we faith stands in the place of, of what? So you just said something is unseen. How do you see that? You can't see it with the naked eye, can you? So you're already launching out what faith does. He's able to look at something. So faith is staying in the place of what? Of seeing it's here. Of, of being able to touch that. It's walked through the door. And we talk about God. No man has ever seen God. Lived. 
there's a sense of, of exalted God, and yet by faith, we see, and by faith in this context, we're going to know. Faith can stand the place of knowledge that we would know through our, our five senses, that we'd understand through our five senses. So it is indeed putting trust in what has been said. That's why faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of God, because it takes you into the unseen. It takes you into what's right before God. It takes you into the unseen areas of the heavenly places and into heaven itself. You don't, all the things that are in store for you, you haven't seen it. And Peter will use, understand that. Even though we hadn't seen him, we, we love him. We love him, even though we hadn't seen him. Well, how could you ever do that? Because of faith. And when we think about the great questions, you know, does God exist? Does God exist? Atheist says no. Why do you think the atheist says no? Five senses, I don't, I've never seen him, never touched him, never did that. Yes, sir? I heard that too. I think that's, that's true. And uh, so what, what I know, I know exists. How do you know it? Is it too bad to say by faith? I trust the evidence. He gives us evidence. I trust what evidence he's given me that he exists. And as we'll see in verse 6, if we're ever going to come to God, we must believe that he what? We must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of them that seek him. That's, that's going to take faith. So faith is being set forth here in a workable definition in your life. When we look at his parts there, I'm not ashamed to say I know it by faith. I'm not going to know it by science. But him being existence doesn't take away scientific knowledge as we know it. He didn't conflict with it. Oh, he can, yes, I believe he could do miracles. But he set that in order. And how, how good is his orderly arrangement of things? This is a big old planet, but it's not the biggest. And did the sun come up about, hey, they, they kind of picked a time, didn't they? Is it going to set about the same time? I wonder how they know that. Because it's consistency of how orderly our cosmos is. And that doesn't prove God. But by faith, like I put trust in you, trust in me, how, how come you can ride with your husband's driving or your wife's driving and you go to sleep. How can you do that? You trust her, trust him, get you there safely. And when you don't trust him, will you go to sleep? No way. <laughs> and you can't wait to let you drive again. About time I got back in this thing, I, I don't trust him. So there's the, there's, there's the, the trust, if it's part of faith, and part of life and you ought not be ashamed of it we, we'll have to stop there because faith is a very strong thing and we're going to spend less than seven it's on a line i'm sure by now and it's out there in the foyer for you to pick up as well thank you